Dr. Lewis Barry Chaper addressing students of Dallas Theological Seminary in Lectures on the Spiritual Life. Lecture 13, Conditions for the Filling of the Spirit. Subtopic 1 continued, Grieve Not the Spirit, and Subtopic 2, Quench Not the Spirit. Thy blessing is what we need this morning through thy word. Speak thou to us in all faithfulness, and may everyone be hearing thy voice and heeding what thou dost say. Bless us, our God, in the understanding of this truth and this great responsibility of walking worthy of the calling wherewith we are called. In the name of Christ, amen. Under the Mosaic system, they lived well in order to be accepted. The present time you live well because you are accepted, and it becomes you. Now I want you to think that through, men. There's a whole, the whole distinction between law and grace as systems is gathered up in that brief statement. Under the law, they were striving to be accepted, good enough to be accepted. Under grace, they're striving to, because they are accepted. When I was 12 years old, my mother had had a very difficult time to get along financially and my father died and the man in the town who had a little money, usually known as the rich man of the town, took a great liking to me and he proposed to adopt me. And he went to talk to my mother about it. I'm thankful to say that never went through. I don't know what would have happened to me if it ever had gone through. Now, there were two propositions he could have made. He could have said, I'm going to watch you now for the next six years from 12 to 18. And if you develop as I think you want to, I'll make out the papers and you will own everything I have when I when you're 18 years old. Now that's putting me on probation. probation. And my motive is to be accepted, hoping to be accepted. I behave in order, at least while the man is in town, I behave in order to be accepted. Another proposition he could make would be this would be to say, now you're 12 years old today, and I expect you to make the same mistakes that other boys make. But I have so much confidence in what I can do for you, so much confidence in what I can do for you, that I'm going to make out the papers right now, and before sun goes down, you'll be my boy and you'll own all my property. Now, still I have those six years to live. And what's my motive now? In order to get the, uh, get the property, I know I have it. To be his son, I am his son. No, you see the difference between the two propositions. The man hasn't made any mistake. The thing that will appeal most to me above anything else if the man hasn't made a mistake in my selection the thing that will appeal to him to me more than anything else that he's trusting me and there's no greater trust ever put upon you than to walk worthy of the calling by which you're called as an incentive it is supreme and superlative it is the last word as an incentive. But we do not know what the life is that 
will be worthy unless we're told. And we couldn't live it in our strength if we wanted to. So he's not only put it before us in very definite terms so that we'd know exactly what a Christian ought to do, but he's placed his spirit to indwell in us whereby we may be enabled to live to the glory of God, to do the thing actually, not merely to hold it as an ideal, but to experience and realize the thing that he has in mind for us. Now this constitutes the spiritual life when you're doing that thing faithfully and actually you're living to the glory of God, meeting the conditions and terms of walking worthy of the calling wherewith you're called in all lowliness and meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. Now, we have come along in this analysis and following out a framework of doctrine. We've seen the different ministries of the Spirit in this age, and at the last one, the filling of the Spirit breaks up into seven manifestations, and the filling of the Spirit will be revealed by seven manifestations of His presence. And having covered that ground, then we turn to the conditions on which we can expect the Spirit to do these things. Now, then, I want you to have this outline in mind. I was before a presbytery of about 50 ministers, and more than that, 75, I guess, and as the speaker of the hour had disappointed them, they came to me and wanted to know if I would speak to them, and I said, I'd be glad to do so. And I just gave them this outline. I had it, of course, in mind. I'll go over it and over it and over it, so that always, whenever you're talking on any aspect of it, you'll know exactly where you are in the framework of doctrine. Go over that thing that I have intimated to you. And some of those men came up afterwards and said, how in the world did you ever keep so much in mind as that? How did you ever keep so much in mind as that? Well, one thing is uh, familiarity. They said to James H. Brooks once, you have a phenomenal memory for the scriptures. He said, on the contrary, I have a very poor memory. But they said, how is it that you can just stand up by the hour and quote the scriptures? He says, it's familiarity. It isn't memory at all. It's familiarity. Familiarity with it. And the way to do is to go over these things until you possess them on the basis of familiarity, whether your memory aids you or not. Now there are conditions, three of them, to be met. Three conditions. Three conditions to be met. And I have named these to you, and you have them in the textbook. The first is, grieve not the Spirit. And the second one is, quench not the Spirit. And the third one is, walk in the Spirit. And I have been dwelling thus far on the doctrine of the grieving of the Spirit, trying to show how it's not the sin so much as it is the failure. It's the failure to make full and complete confession as soon as you know anything is wrong. That is necessary. And apart from that, we do grieve the Spirit. That's walking in the light as he is in the light continual adjustment to everything that he reveals.
I'm going to turn with you this morning to a scripture that will shed more light upon this 15th chapter of the gospel by Luke. Luke chapter 15. About 40 years ago, I was conducting an evangelistic meeting in the city of Watertown, New York, in one of the large churches, and there was an immense throng of people coming every night. And one of the most prominent citizens of the town, a businessman, was coming every night and coming late and sitting down in the back seat. And then he slipped out before the meeting was finally dismissed. And some of the people were quite concerned about it and thought they ought to get out there and stop him and talk with him. I said, leave him alone. Don't you stop him. Let him come as long as he will. And don't drive him away by by attacking him at all. God is doing something with him and let him come. And he came. One night I had prepared to preach on a certain subject. I don't remember what. And in those days I had to lead the singing and do the preaching beside. It was not far from there in a meeting that an old lady came up one night. She said, I'm worried about you. I said, what's the matter? But she says, you're doing too much. You're leading all this singing and you're doing the preaching. She said, could I make a suggestion? I said, sure. What is it? She said, why don't you take somebody with you to do the preaching? They'll be able to take the, all the conceit out of you, I assure you of that. You just give them time and a chance, they'll take it out of you. Well, I had prepared for something. I don't know what it was. And during the song service, I was strongly impressed that God was telling me to preach on the prodigal son. Well, I said... Lord, I haven't prepared to preach on the prodigal son. And he said, preach on the prodigal son. And I said, I hold some strange views about that. And he said, preach your views. <laughs> so I didn't have anything left to argue about. So that when I got ready to preach, I just opened the Bible to the 15th of Luke and preached without any preparation and shocked Mrs. Chaffer most to death. She was there because she knew what I had expected to preach on. And then see me go wild like that, she didn't know what was going to happen. Well, the 15th chapter of Luke. And I, when I had finished, this man on the back seat, instead of getting up and going out, got up and came right straight up the aisle. I can see him now, walking straight up, and came clear up to me. And he said, I've been a prodigal in a far country for 35 years. But he said, I'm coming back tonight. And that's what God wanted me to preach on that subject for. And he was wonderfully restored and made a very wonderful Christian when he came back that way. Now I'm going to just run through the... It's a parable in three parts. A parable in three parts. I said to you the other day, don't you ever try to preach the gospel to the unsaved on the parable of the prodigal son. Almost always when I have taught on this, I've raised the ire of the preacher, and I found out afterwards that I was shattered in one of his pet sermons. He just didn't want that destroyed. Well, now, don't you have a pet sermon on the prodigal son? You can't make out a thing on that for the salvation of a soul, not a thing. And be true to the doctrine. Then drew near unto him all the publicans 
and sinners for to hear him. Now, who are these? Publicans were all Jews who had turned traitor against the country. Their people are enough to be tax gatherers for Rome. And sinners were Jews who had got had just failed to bring in the sacrifices at the appointed time, and they stood as sinners before God. They were out of fellowship because of want of sacrifices. Now everything depends here on your identifying these people. Don't think that it's some crowd of Gentiles that have come up here. It isn't at all. They're all Jews, but they're out of fellowship. And the Pharisees and scribes, Jews again, who would lay down their lives to be punctual in the last degree of preserving, of observing the law, never failed in the world to present the sacrifices at the time. Because that way that Paul could say that of himself that he was before the law blameless didn't mean that he never did wrong. But he always brought in the sacrifices. The Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man, Christ, receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Then Christ spake a parable unto them. Now, if you're a murmuring scribe and Pharisee, maybe the, par the parable will fit you, but be careful that it it may not fit you at all. Not all of the Bible is addressed to you, you know. It's all for you, but it's not all about you. It's all for you, but it's not all about you. And the average preacher just opens his Bible and puts his finger on the text and takes for granted, of course, that that's being in the Bible belongs to everybody. Maybe it does and maybe it doesn't. Oh, that calls upon you to be a right, a one who rightly divides the word of truth. And I've been accused of being the arch-modernist because I am classifying scripture and saying that it doesn't all belong to me. <laughs> He spake this parable unto them, one parable in three parts. It's not plural, not three parables, but one parable in three parts. The first one about a lost sheep, the second one about a lost coin, and the last one about a lost son. He said, what manner of man, uh, what man among you having and hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the pasture, the wilderness, the open country, and go after that one which is lost. I don't think that there's anything that's more disturbed sound doctrine than the hymn the ninety and nine. It's based on this parable, and it's a picture, a tempted picture, of the salvation of a soul. In fact, Mr. Moody was preaching in London and uh, had occasion to refer to this, and he turned to Sankey when he got through and said, Sing something. Well, I've heard Sankey tell this himself, told it to me, as one who was sympathetic because I know something about composing songs. And he had a little clipping, just a little clipping from a paper of the words of the hymn of the 99. And he put that up on his little organ and sat down there and sang, composed as he went on, sang the first verse right through. Then he said he was just frightened almost to death because he wasn't sure that he could reproduce it in the second verse at all. Not at all. 
when he got through all three verses and then it was written out and we have the hymn, the 99. And I just wish it never had gotten out because it's just formed more doctrine than and, and failure in doctrine than almost any other thing that I can think of. You'll find it all the time running through hymns and uh, going out to find the sheep that were lost. Now, if it's the percentage of those that are lost and those that are saved, and he had a hundred in the pasture that were all right, one was lost, you better turn it around. He may have one that's saved in the pasture and a hundred are out of lost if, if you're talking about unregenerate people or the percentage won't work that way. When he had found it, he laid it on his shoulder. Now I want to say a word here that's very important. A thing can be lost in two different ways according to the New Testament. It can be lost in such a way that it needs to be saved. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost, or it may be lost in the way in which it needs to be found. And the, the sheep is lost and found, the coin is lost and found, and the son is lost and found. That's restoration, not salvation at all, that's restoration. And when he cometh home, he will call it together his friends, and neighbors saying unto them, Rejoice with me, I have found the sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repented. Who does he refer to now? Well, you have it in the first verse. There drew near unto him sinners and publicans. one who is under the covenant and for you it would be a Christian if they were going to bring that over this side of the cross and use it as an illustration it's quite a stretch of and strain to bring it over on this side of the cross over one sinner that repented now, what is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind. A change of mind. And that's what's called for if we confess our sins due to a change of mind. Then he's faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. Now, all I've been teaching on this thing up to the present is the repentance let me say once for all, men, and you listen very closely, that repentance belongs to a saved person or a covenant person, and it's not to an unsaved or unregenerate person at all. Repentance is a part of believing. It's included in believing. Don't get the impression from what I say this morning, don't get the impression that I'm not teaching that a sinner to be saved doesn't need to repent. Of course he needs to repent. But all the repentance he can bring is included in believing. It's included in believing. It's a change of mind. You can't take your confidence off from whatever it is now if you're unsaved and put it on the Savior without a change of mind. And that's repentance. Now I move on into the next, the second parable. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, the ten pieces were alone, worn as a headpiece, a band around the forehead. And if one of those pieces of silver worn by a married woman. If one were lost and out of place, it was symbolical to the people that she was not in right relation with her husband. 
she couldn't appear on the street, she couldn't appear anywhere with that coin gone. So she makes a thorough business and she sweeps the house and brings up everything in the house into the center until she finds her coin and it's placed back. She doesn't make a new one, she puts it back in place and everything is all right. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she has found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which was lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels, not the joy of the angels at all. And so we have another old gospel hymn, Ring the Bells of Heaven, There is Joy Today, for a sinner returning from the wild. See the Father meets him out upon the way, welcoming his weary wandering child. Glory, glory, how the angels sing. Glory, glory, how the loud harps ring. Tis the ransomed army, like the mighty sea, pealing forth the, the anthem of the free, all based on one supposition, that it's a sinner being saved, and it's not that at all. It's not a sinner being saved at all. There is joy in the presence of the angels. It's not the angels, it's the presence. It's the one in whose presence they are. The joy of the one who found his sheep. Now don't you ever talk about a sinner coming home. That's another abominable hymn, Lord, I'm coming home. Lord, I'm coming home. Why? Because you never were there before. That's why. You can't come home if you never were there before. I'm coming home again. Never were there. Don't say you're coming home again. They never were there. They've always been lost. And now they're saved for the first time. Let's get that thing straight and... It'll save you from getting all mixed in your gospel preaching. Now for the short story, beginning at verse 11. The shortest, most concise story I think it's ever been written. In the first five verses, you'll have more information given to you than in any other place I know. And he said, a certain man had two sons. Now, if I picked up a book to read it, a story book, and it started out by saying a certain man, I would identify at once, that's the hero. Incidentally, he had two sons. And one was a publican and sinner, and the other was a murmuring scribe and Pharisee. He had two sons, but he is the hero of the story. In other words, keep your eye on the father, not on either son. Not on either son, but on the father. For the story is telling you of the father altogether. Now the younger said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that belongeth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance and riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, 
and he sent him into the field to feed swine. Now to a Jew, that's the lowest, most degrading thing that could ever be said or done. I'm not responsible now for this story at all. It's my Lord that takes this boy out of his home and takes him clear down into that far country and puts him in a hog pen and brings him back and restores him to his father's house again. That's my fa that's my Savior's story. It isn't mine. But I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to change it. So you can see why uh, at Watertown I hesitated when I never had preached what I believed regarding the prodigal son. And the Lord said, preach what you believe. And this man came up and said, I've been in a far country for 35 years. Come back tonight. When he fain would have filled his belly with the husks which the swine did eat, no man gave unto him. He didn't have a very good job, not much of a job, no board other than to steal the wild cucumbers from the hogs and eat what they were eating. And then it was he came to himself. And he said, how many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to Father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Now he couldn't send any message. He had no way of notifying them that he was coming. And he went back, as I said the other day, and when he was a great way off, his father saw him because he was always looking that way. I don't miss this. The father was always looking that way. If the boy had come a month before, your father would have seen him. Or a day before makes no difference. And the father went out to meet him. I pictured this the other day as a travesty on the truth with apologies to God and everybody else involved that the father said, get me that hickory club. I'm going out to beat that boy before he ever comes on my property. No, he didn't say that. He went out and kissed him. Now, I told you how I came to the knowledge of this with such tears of sorrow as I was lying in bed in the hospital in California, I saw that the story was right. I had always felt that there was something out of order here, that the father shouldn't have kissed the boy until he made his confession, but he didn't. He, he kissed him first, and then he made his confession. And why? Why? Because the picture is of a propitious God. The Father is propitious, and confession doesn't make him so. Now you have a sin. You bring it to him. It's not hard to bring it to him when he's going to kiss you before you begin to tell you, you begin to tell him at all. And you're bringing it to a propitious God. Don't be afraid of him because he is propitious. And who made him propitious? Why the son bearing that very sin has made God's attitude different towards you with regard to it. And I love to say he's propitious to infinity, absolutely to infinity. God is propitious. Write that down on your heart. God is propitious. And the test is that 
whether it's a saint that sinned or an unsaved person that comes to God, he never strikes a blow, but just receives them. He restores the saint, and he saves the sinner, then and there. How can God, being as holy as he is, a just and holy God, how can he receive a sinner without striking a blow? How can he do that without scolding, without reproof? Why? Because in his sight it's all born. Whether they believe it or not, God believes that his son has borne it. And that's where we were in First John, in that uh, courtroom scene. I bore that sin in my body on the tree. You remember we went over that. Now notice verse 20. He arose and came to his father. When he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said what he had practiced and prepared to say. Father, I have sinned against heaven in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. And that's as far as he got. He never finished his, his prepared speech. He never got the last thing out at all. Make me as one of thy hired servants. He never said that. Well, he didn't. That would have broken the old man's heart. But the father broke in then and said, Bring forth, bring forth, bring forth, bring forth. And everything was changed. Why? Because the boy has made his repentance and confession. He has brought his repentance and confession. And he doesn't have to say anymore, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight am no more worthy to be called thy son. Bring forth. Bring forth. Now if you've got to want to be dramatic in preaching, there's your chance to be dramatic in preaching. Bring forth. Bring forth. Then he says of the son, Bring forth the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive. There you have to know the custom of the Jews. They count a son as lost and dead. When a, when a son, for instance, accepts Christ in a Jewish family and becomes saved, they count him as dead. Sometimes they have a funeral and count him as dead. My son is dead in the sense in which this story presents him. He was lost in the sense in which the story presents him and was not saved. He was found. There's a difference. He was not saved. He was found. And so over and over again, I have been found and restored and restored. So let that truth bear its, its message to your heart, man. If you were to say that the prodigal was saved, then you'd have to say that he was saved without, without any believing, because there isn't a word here about believing anything, without any gospel, because there's no gospel here at all. You'd have to say that he was saved without any blood, I remember I said that once, and the preacher came up to me and said, Oh, yes, there was. He said, They killed a calf. But I said, Brother, it wasn't a sacrificial offering at all that killed the calf. It was for a feast. And they had a feast. And there was music and dancing. And I said the other day they didn't invite the neighbors in because no neighbor would come in to a feast like that. They wouldn't come in. They couldn't understand the restoration of that. And so, the outside world can't understand how God can forgive, and they don't like it when he does. They are jealous and, and hateful when he does forgive and cleanse. They think of some partiality or something of the kind. Well, so much now. Come to page 250, please. The second condition on which we may be filled with the Spirit. 
There are three, not any more, not any less, conditions on which one may be filled with the Spirit. The first one I've been drawing upon so far, and I can't stay so long on any others. The time is too short, and I'm running very close to the border and, and getting through with this course at all. If I don't behave, we won't get through. But I'm tempted all the time to keep bearing down upon these distinctions because I'd give anything in the world that I had if somebody had talked to me as I talked to you. Oh, how much I could have been saved. But I had to find these things out by the hardest method in the world, and that is experience. I had to find out. And I don't know where I can send you to anybody's writings to tell you these things. I don't know anything about it. These are the essentials of the gospel. And if you have these things straight, you're not going to do, you're not going to misstate the gospel. Now how will you, how will you be filled? The second condition is quench not the spirit. <coughs> quench not the spirit. Not the sense of putting out a fire at all. Not extinguishing the spirit or just causing him to depart. He may be grieved, but he's never grieved away. He may be quenched, but he never leaves. The spirit never leaves in the world. If one has been saved, the spirit never leaves in the world. He's always there. I sat down in a mission in the old John 316 mission in New York beside an old man one night and he was just, he was a frightful sight. It was right down in the Mulberry district where the worst and awful life of, of sin is lived. Poor old man, he was, he had the signs of having known culture once. He had long hair clear down to his coat collar. And one foot, instead of having a shoe on it, was tied up in a potato sack. It's a common sack. And that's the appearance that he presented. He said, I won't let anybody ever talk to me on this subject again. He said, I have tried everything you've told me and didn't for me. Trouble is, they were talking to him all the time about getting saved. And it wouldn't work. That I won't let anybody talk to me on this subject again. So as soon as the meeting was over, though I had been the preacher of the night, I went to this old man and took him a little by guile. I said to him, I said, I heard you say you wouldn't let anybody talk to you. I said, I won't talk to you. But I said, would you mind talking to me? And he smiled and said, yes, I'll talk to you. So we went over and sat down by ourselves. I said, now tell me all about it. The first thing he said was, once I knew the Lord. Once I knew the Lord. I said, you mean to tell me you were saved once? He said, beyond the shadow of a doubt. Well, I said, then listen. I'm not here to tell you anything about yourself now. I can say this, that if you ever were saved, you're saved now. And I said, you can't be saved over again. It won't work. He said, indeed, it doesn't work. I said, what you need now is to make a confession of your sin and by repentance to come back to God. Oh, he said, I believe that's true. I believe it, he said. I woke up in the night last night and I wondered if that could be true. And so, though I don't like to be a father confessor, I knelt down by that old man and heard his sordid story of awful sin and awful wandering from God. And he arose and stood on his feet just as happy a Christian as I ever saw. Just as happy a Christian. He was restored. He wasn't saved over. He was restored. There is no such thing as being saved over. There couldn't be such a thing as that because the Spirit had never left him. And he had been protected and guided and helped in 10,000 ways of which he knew nothing about. Had he died any time, like the prodigal, 
in the pig pen. If the prodigal had died in the hog pen, he would have died a son. He was a son all the time. And so this old man, if he had died, he would have gone straight to heaven on the merit of the Son of God. I can hear somebody say, well, he wasn't very good. Well, people don't go to heaven because they're good. If they do, how are you going to get in? <laughs> now, come on, be fair about it. How are you going to get in if you have to be good to go to heaven? Of course you're not. You go by the goodness and merit of the Son of God. He's your Savior. He's your Savior. Now the Savior, the Spirit, never leaves. But we quench the Spirit when we say no to Him. It's the yielded will. Whenever we say no to the will of God, we're quenching the Spirit. I don't suppose I can add a thing to what is here written down in these several pages on this thing. I don't think I can. I've written it very carefully. The question is of finding and doing the will of God. Always ready to do the will of God. Turn to John chapter 15 for a moment. John chapter 15. There is such a thing as maintaining communion with the Lord. And there is such a thing as maintaining union with the Lord. As a saved person, God brings you into union with his Son. You're joined to him. And that can never be broken. But communion can be broken. How I have been trying to tell you this for the last few lessons. Communion can be broken. And now the question is, when the branch here in the 15th chapter of John, when, the, when they're told to abide in him, is that to keep up union or keep up communion? Which? Is it a question of keeping up union? You don't have to keep up union. But you do have to preserve communion. Now notice in verse 2, every branch in me, that's union. That's union, every branch in me that bears not fruit. Why doesn't it bear fruit? Because it isn't keeping up communion, that's why. He purges it. And the branch that does bear fruit, he purges it or prunes it that it bear more fruit. The branch that in him that does not bear fruit, he serves, reserves the right to take it up out of its place. Now there's lots of fanciful attempts at the interpretation here. We've had one teacher in the school teaching that he lifts it off the ground and props it up as the way, the way under fruit trees, you see, props that are under limbs that are bearing too heavy a load. He lifts it up off the ground. No, it isn't that at all. He takes it actually home to heaven. He raptures it. He raptures it home to heaven. Again, someone says, well, it isn't bearing fruit. It has no business to go to heaven. Then how are you going to go? How are you going to go if it's a question of fruit bearing? No, you don't go by fruit bearing. You go by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10. Oh, the years and years I preached on the 
abiding in Christ. It was a Sunday morning pet sermon when I had the large audience Sunday morning that I spoke on this subject. And I didn't know any more about it than the littlest child in the audience. If anybody had asked me what what it meant to abide, I just couldn't tell them. I thought maybe it meant more prayer and more testimony, more Bible reading. No, it's right here. I'd read it uh, before people and by myself hundreds and hundreds of times. Verse 10, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. How shall I maintain union with him or communion with him by keeping his commandments? And those are not the commandments of Moses at all. He never says a thing about his commandments in, in all his teaching till you come to the upper room. He vindicates the Mosaic system, but he doesn't say that we're appointed to keep the Mosaic commandments, for we're not. But we have an appointment to keep his commandments. And here's a little piece of work that nobody has done. And that is to draw out the commandments of Christ and what is really meant by a phrase of this kind. I read on. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now the Arminian idea is that that by abiding we keep ourselves saved. Oh, they love to dwell on that, especially as it is in verse 6. They love to dwell on that thing. I haven't time to go into it. Now, was Christ trying to keep saved by keeping his Father's commandments? He said, as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, no, he was maintaining fellowship with his Father by always doing the thing that was pleasing to his father. He was committed to his father's will. And that's what it means to avoid quenching the spirit, always doing the things that are pleasing to him. Never say no to God. Never say no to God. Now I'm going to Romans chapter 12 a minute. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This is the opening of the, what we call the practical portion or of this great epistle. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by these mercies of God, on the ground of these mercies, what mercies were all that he's given in the preceding chapters of justification, forgiveness, salvation, and uh, sanctification. The whole thing and security is all in the preceding chapters. On the ground of these mercies, I beseech you, therefore, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this. Don't be run in the mold of this world, but be transformed, really transfigured. I want to take more time with that. I'll begin with it next time. We're dismissed.